Father, thank you. Oh, we needed that. That's like tonic for the soul until I reach my home. It's a crazy world we're in right now. Pastor Lindsay just led us in prayer, praying for the coronavirus. The whole Adventist church is praying now for the coronavirus wherever it is on this planet. We're praying for our leaders who have to decide, do we convene the whole church in Indianapolis this summer or not? I can't imagine the magnitude of that decision. But we're lifting them up as Pastor Lindsay has just done. You do whatever it takes. We got to get home. But before we go home, we have a world to reach. And we have, we got us. And so, dear God, take this us moment. Infuse it in our minds and hearts with the Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So a friend of mine sent me an email. And the title of the email is Pastoral Visit. I've got to make a pastoral visit this afternoon. So I know, about, uh, I know about pastoral visits. Just a short little email. I'll read it to you. After the birth of their child, an Episcopal pastor wearing his clerical collar. You've seen those clerical collars. You know he's a pastor. An Episcopal pastor wearing his clerical co collar visited his wife in the hospital. He greeted her with a hug and kiss and gave her another hug and kiss when he left. Later, the wife's roommate commented to her, your pastor is sure friendlier than mine. <laughs> oh, I love that. Because you know what? There's a, the, the, the point is, obviously, between husbands and wives, there's a lot of hugging and kissing going on. You can be a clergy couple and have hugging and kissing going on if that's okay with you. And we all know why we do it. It's to have babies, right? <laughs> right. So, so you can imagine... Zachariah and Elizabeth, they've been a clergy couple all their lives, and they really were a clergy couple. And they've been hugging and kissing all their lives, but they have no child. Like 10% of American couples, no child. So you can also imagine the flabbergasted shock when the elderly man hears that angel announce to him that he and his wife are going to have a baby. How in the whole wide world could that possibly happen? Let's pick up the story right there. Come on, go to it. Luke chapter 1. The Gospel of Luke chapter 1, you got it on your phone, pull it out. Luke chapter 1, we're going to pick it up in verse 18. I'm in the NIV and the page number, if you, you want to grab the pew Bible in front of you, the page number is 688. Let's go. Verse 18, and Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man, I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. And the angel said to him, yo, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you to tell you this good news, and I, it is obvious to me that you do not believe this is possible. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you some time to think on this in total silence. You will not be able to speak. That's right. Verse 21, and now you will be silent. And you will not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, because he's leading in worship and everybody's out there in the temple. Where is he? Where is he? Where is, he? Where is, the, where is the leading pastor today for worship? Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. Verse 22, and when he came out, he could not speak to them. Oh. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. And when his time of service was completed, he returned home. And he and Elizabeth resumed their, their hugging and kissing. And guess what? You got it. This elderly father who said, how can it be? Nine months later, believes, and he exclaims, let it be. I want you to see this. Oh, my. Unbelievable. Verse 57. So you got to drop down a bit in that Luke chapter 1. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. But, of course, they're having parties all over the town. And on the eighth day, so this is little John is now eight days old, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zachariah. He's going to be Zachariah Jr. We just know it. But, no, 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 no. His mother spoke up and said, no, 
He is to be called John. They said to her, girl, there is no one among your family tree who has that name. You got no John in your tree. Why wouldn't you name him Zachariah Jr.? We're going to ask his dad just to make sure that you got this right. And so they go to, uh, they go to his dad in uh, verse 62, and they made signs to his father. Which, by the way, indicates that probably Zachariah was not only dumb or mute, he was deaf. He couldn't hear either. And Gabriel said, I'm going to give you silence. Boy, he got silence. He says, give me something to write on. Give me something to write on. They find him. They finally there in uh, verse 63, they bring him that uh, writing tablet. He asked for the writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, with that little stylus on that clay palette, he, he inscribes the words, his name is John. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free and he began to speak, praising God. And I am sure he is standing and there's high fives all over the community. And everybody's going like this. Whoa, this is some baby. You see what happened to that dad? The moment he said his name, boom, it all came back. In verse 65, and all the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about these things. You see, back then they didn't have, they didn't have telephones, and they didn't have telegrams, but they did have tell a neighbor. And all you have to do is tell one little secret to a neighbor, and it's all over the world, trust me. And you don't need electronics. And the whole community in the region is talking about these things. Verse 66, and everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? What an appropriate question on this weekend where we're having a parenting conference called Disciple. Oh, last night, I wish I could have been there in the youth chapel. It was full as Ben and Brianna Martin are leading us, thinking about creative parenting for third millennials. Wow. There isn't a child born whose parent, whose father, whose mother looks in that tiny little prune face and says, I wonder what this girl's going to turn out to be. What's this boy going to turn out to be? Well, you know what? Actually, Zachariah and Elizabeth didn't have to sit around and say, what do you think the boy's going to turn out to be? They've already been told. They have been given in no uncertain terms the exact mission of this child. I want you to go back just in case you forgot it. Go back and pick it up there in verse 13 because this is when Gabriel shows up. This is when Gabriel absolutely shocks Zechariah. He cannot even speak. Gabriel shows up, verse 13, but the angel said to Zechariah, do not be afraid. Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. He has not been praying for a baby. Nobody that age prays for a baby. He's been praying for Jesus to come. He's been praying for the Messiah to arrive. Your prayers have been heard. I got good news for you. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. Well, what's that have to do with us? Well, listen, you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Verse 16, and he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Now, here it comes. This is the reason your baby is going to be born. Now, listen to me, Zachariah. Get this clear, and I want you to tell your wife about it. And when that baby comes, I want you to remember these words. I spoke them to you right here in church in worship to make ready, how's it go? To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. They knew. Put those words on the screen for us, please. Come on. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's the mission of your child, Zechariah. And by the way, on the authority of that one line, I need to remind every young parent who's here in worship today or watching on a screen somewhere on this planet, I need to remind every future young parent who is here today and listening, I need to remind every parent today that on the authority of this one line, this generation that is being birthed in the very context of the soon return of Jesus, this generation has been given the identical one-line mission to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Come on. 
Once you have been given the why, mommy and daddy, once you understand the why your child was born, you will better understand the how your child must live. Let me take a few moments and talk about that how. I'm really excited about this, as you can tell. I want to share with you seven mentoring practices that will turn a young parent into a vital mentor. Reach inside your worship bulletin right now. Did you get worship bulletins? Reach inside and pull out a study. There's a study guide, a brand new study guide. Brittany's put a beautiful study guide together, and I want you to see it. And this is cardstock, so you can carry this thing with you wherever you move to. You can take this with you. You say, I'm not even a parent yet. Good. I'm thinking about you especially. You write this down. Someday you'll want to know what you discovered today. Grab that study guide. And let's put the uh, title slide on the screen, please, because there at the bottom you see, those of you watching live streaming right now, you're already at that website, but those of you watching on television right now, you see the website, newperceptions.tv. New Perceptions, one word, .tv. You go there. You're looking for a little series called Prepared Question Mark. And this is number three, turning young parents into vital mentors. You go there and it says study guide. Click on it. Seven mentoring practices. Let's go. Mentoring practice number one, parents must worship the giver of the child. Okay, so as soon as the baby's born, notice how Zachariah responds. Verse 67, and his father Zachariah, well, the little John is, is eight days old. And his father Zachariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. The first response of a parent every single day is to worship the giver of your child. Would you jot this down? Because it's one of those great laws of parenting. You can't pass on what you don't live out. You can't pass on what you don't live out. The child will only get it, this business of worshiping the giver, if you do it. If you don't worship the giver, the child will never worship the giver. No, why, why should she? Why should he? They've been watching you. Now, I learned something last night. This is fascinating. I had never thought of this before. So Ben and Brianna, uh, they're going to be there, by the way, 3 o'clock this afternoon. Don't miss it. 3 o'clock in the youth chapel. They, they taught a point I had never heard. How did I miss out on this? Here's what they said. If you want your child to have a relationship with your child's Savior, a relationship with the giver of your child to you, if you want your child to have a relationship, you know what you got to do? You got to let the child watch you having worship. I didn't know that. I thought when you have worship, you just close the door and you have it all privately. You got to let that child walk in on you, Daddy, when you're there alone with your Bible. Let that child sit down with you. Just, hey, go get your Bible. Come here, sit with Daddy. We'll have worship together. You let the child have worship with you. You don't, you don't hide it from the child. Because the child's watching you like a hawk, and that mini little hard disk in that beautiful brain of that girl, that boy, is recording every single detail. And that child will say, ah, that's how you have a relationship with the Almighty God. Oh, that's good. You know what, Brianna and Ben, uh, they got two precious boys, and, and, and we all love them around here. But Brianna, in her spare time as a mother, can you imagine this? She has a website. I'm going to give you the website right now. Jot it down because it's not in your study guide. Scribble it in the margin. DiscipleMama.com. I like that because that's what mamas do. They disciple. That's what papas do. They disciple. Disciple Mama. So I went to that website again. That girl has put together something that's uh, that is, uh, totally amazing. We talked about social media missionaries last week. She'd be one of them. There are people all over the world that come to this site. How to deal, listen to this, this is one of her blogs, how to deal with mama guilt, because there's not a mother that, that doesn't feel guilty at times. There's not a daddy that doesn't feel guilty either. How to help your child worship Jesus. Oh, my. Go to the website, disciplemama.com. Now, the point is, I know that you wanted your child. Now, some of you got surprised with it, but I know you wanted the child. I know that God wanted you to have that child. Now, here's the deal. I don't care the circumstances that got you pregnant. The fact of the matter is that God chose for that baby of yours to be born. Some of you have heard the story of your past. Let me tell you something, girl. Let me tell you something, boy. It doesn't matter the circumstances of your birth. What counts is that you got chosen. You were chosen to be born. 
You need to lock that in your brain every single day. I was chosen. I was chosen. Mom and dad, you need to lock that into your brain every day. She is chosen. She was born because God chose her for us. You have, do you understand that you have the greatest mission a human being can have on this planet? Get this. Here's what you got to do. This is why it's so great. You have to take a child from zero, okay? So this is zero. You have to take a child from zero all the way to eternity. That's your mission should you choose to accept it. It's from zero to eternity. It doesn't get greater or more, or more significant than that. Zero to eternity, zero to eternity. You may not even be pregnant yet, but it is none too early to begin living by this same mission. Put it on the screen, please, again for us. What's the mission, Dwight? To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. If you have been born in this season of the soon coming of Jesus, then you were born with this mission. If you're too young right now to even know that there's such a thing as a mission, your parents are old enough and wise enough to now know this is your mission. Whether you are adopted, whether you came by natural birth, it does not matter. The moment you came, this is your mission. All right, seven of these. Here comes number two. Mentoring practice number two. Parents must declare the name of the child. We, we read it just a moment ago. Both Elizabeth and Zachariah are absolutely convicted this is to be the name. We didn't have the luxury, at least Karen and I didn't, of an angel coming along and saying, by the way, you're wondering what to name that boy? You call him uh, Kirk. No, we just chose Kirk, Dwight Kirk, Patrick Nelson. But you know what? We didn't do this. But you can do it. You're part of a generation being born on the edge of eternity. Why don't you and your husband, some of you are anticipating that child. You're going to have a child someday. And you're thinking, man, what are we going to name this child? Why don't you do this? Why don't you huddle up, just the two of you, husband and wife, with Jesus? And you say, Jesus, no, given the mission we have, given the values we've embraced, given the dreams we have for this child, what name would you recommend that we choose for our child? Someday that little girl is going to ask you, I promise you, someday that boy is going to climb, under, climb up under your lap, Daddy, and go say, hey, Daddy, why am I named this? Why would you name me this? And that will be your aha moment given by the God of the universe to tell that child, you know what, son, before you were born, we picked your name out. Your mother and I prayed. We, we asked Jesus to lead us to the name that would capture the values that we embrace. That's your name. Do you know what? That kid's going to go through life with his shoulders thrown back. I got named because Jesus helped my parents pick it. <sighs> really? Yeah. Okay. There's seven mentoring practices. Here comes mentoring practice number three. Parents must pronounce the blessing of the child. Now, this is really good because from verse 68 through verse 79, Zechariah is pronouncing a blessing upon his newborn son. Now, little John, come on, you understand? He's eight days old. Little John cannot comprehend a word of what his father is now saying, but that's okay. The father addresses his boy, and I want you to see this. This is beautiful, actually. It's the, it's the actual wording of a personal blessing. Pronouncement. Drop down to verse 76. So you can see old man Zechariah, he's got that baby in his arms, eight days old. And you, my child, he's speaking to John, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him. Whoa. Blessing. Gary Smalley, the great family life specialist, Gary Smalley and the psychologist John Trent, collaborated together with a wonderful book. You can still get the book. It's being printed. It's called The Blessing. If you're a young parent, buy the book. It's a little paperback, The Blessing. In the, in the book, The Blessing, they remind us that from time immemorial, fathers and mothers have often gathered their little ones to them, and they have put their hands on those heads, and they have pronounced the blessing of God over their children. Abraham did it. Isaac did it. Jacob did it. Joseph did it. Moses did it. Everybody did it. Jesus, in fact, himself did it. Do you know that? Yeah, when, they brought the, when the mothers brought the little babies, they said, we want you to pronounce a blessing, please. Pronounce a blessing on our child. And Jesus did it. Now, uh, Gary Smalley and John Trent remind us that in 1602, there was a book on Jewish family life and practice in the, with, the, with the German name Brandspiegel. All right? In the book, these words on the screen, 1602, before the children can walk, 
They should be carried on the Sabbath and on the holy days to their father and mother to receive their blessing. And after they're able to walk, they should go to them of their own accord with body bent and with head bowed to receive the blessing. What a powerful way through touch and prayer all through your child's stages. I remember when I left home, my folks gathered me. They gathered around me and my little brother and sister, but I'm leaving home for the first time to go away to Singapore to Academy, and their hands being laid on, and the blessing is being pronounced. And my dad read the same verse that his dad read to him when he left home for the first time. The blessing got passed. Now, I didn't think a thing about it, but it was a big deal. You can do it too. All right, a mentoring practice number four. Oh, this is a good one. Parents must focus on the Savior of the child. All right, Zechariah certainly did that all the way through his pronounced blessing. The child psychologist, Donna Hobbenicht, she's a member of our congregation, happened to be sitting right over there in First Church. She has written a wonderful book, titled the book, How to Help Your Child Really Love Jesus. In fact, if you bring your child to us for dedication to the Lord Jesus, we'll give you a free copy of that book just like that. In the book, she tells a story about a little family with a two-year-old named Jonathan, okay? So the two-year-old's going to church. Well, they're in a church. It's a Sabbath. It's a little Adventist church. And when mother and father uh -uh, took their eye off of that energetic little two-year-old, he broke away from them, raced up onto the platform, grabbed the prayer mic, put it in his mouth, and said, Hi, Jesus! And the place all laughed. They were so happy. The parents were going under the pew. Why was everybody so happy? Because little Jonathan, two years old, associated coming to church with being with Jesus. That's why. He got it. Now, Donna has some great principles, and I'm going to ask you to jot these down because I put them in there for you. I'm getting a bit of a feedback and a ring on this, uh, guys. Turn me down just a little, please. All right. Thank you. So Donna Hobbenick, Donna Hobbenick comes up with this list of six, and let's put it down. Just, just jot these down. Show your children. Number one, show your children Jesus' love through your own love. Well, that's good. So what's she saying? She said, hug your little baby, and you say, Mommy loves you, and so does Jesus. Daddy loves you. Oh, Daddy loves you, and so does Jesus love you. What, what's happening? The child is associating parent, parental love with Jesus' love. That's all you want. That's all you want to have happen. <laughs> uh, here's number two. Jot it down. Paint a friendly picture of Jesus. Keyword friendly. Instead of, oh my, how sad you have made Jesus, emphasize a smiling Jesus, how happy Jesus is with what you've done. You go, boy, you go, girl. You just made Jesus so happy. Okay, here's a good one. I thought this one was good. Number three, encourage spontaneous conversation with Jesus. Jesus, Christy, feels so sad. Please help her to feel happy soon. Jesus, look at this beautiful rose. You made this. Smell that. Jesus made that. Thank you, Jesus. What's happening? What's happening is the, ch the child is hearing conversation to Jesus all through the day. And it's not like something you do only at night when you kneel down with your parents. It's something you do. You can talk to Jesus all day long. And that's exactly what we want that child to know. What number was that? Was that three? Okay, number four. Joyfully introduce Jesus through stories and pictures about his life. Have you ever heard of My Bible Friends? We've got a whole generation raised on My Bible Friends. Guess what? They're still in print. My grandchildren are reading them now. My Bible Friends is a beautiful way for youngsters to meet Jesus. The pictures are full page. You'll never forget them out of your mind. And so is a picture of Jesus. This is another idea. A picture of Jesus surrounded by children. Put that on the wall so every time she wakes up, every time he wakes up, he sees the picture of Jesus. Oh, he's a friend of children. That's good. Uh, number five, remind them that Jesus hurts when they hurt, that he would love to take them in his arms and comfort them. Tell them Jesus can be their best friend, their forever friend who never abandons them. One more. Number six, the most imp oh, this is, this is important. The most important and impressive thing you can do is to show your children openly how much you love Jesus, and they will learn to love him too. Isn't that good? You can do it. All right, practice number five. Parents must confirm the mission. Write that in, please. The mission of the child. Now, let's read that again. Verse 76, we were just there a moment ago. And you, my child, the words of blessing, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. 
Zechariah is not only blessing his baby, he's confirming the baby's mission to make ready. Put it on the screen again, because it's every baby that's being born in this third millennial generation to make ready a people. Can we put it on the screen? To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The reason I'm insisting on that is because if we can just lock this in our minds, it'll stay with us. It will just be gone. My mother, God bless her, did not choose my career or my calling. It wasn't until I was a junior in high school that God said, no, you're not going into medicine, you're going into ministry. But my mother never pushed me one way or the other. She just fed whatever was happening in my life as far as life vocation. But she took the opportunity, this is why I'm telling you this, she took the opportunity every time it was appropriate to remind me that I was born for a reason. She said, Dwight, Jesus has a plan for your life. Son, come on, boy. Jesus has a plan for your life. When I nearly drowned at the three years of age at a little mountain lake, and they pulled me out of that water, I should be dead. Boy, did she start zooming that in. Is somebody's keeping you alive, Dwight. Jesus has spared your life for a reason. At the age of 10 in that same mountain lake when I skied slalom, one ski on water, head first into a cement pylon. They said it sounded like a watermelon dropping on concrete when the head hit. She said, Dwight, somebody's keeping you alive. Jesus is keeping you alive. At the age of 16, when I nearly drowned snorkeling in Guam, she said, Dwight, I don't know how my mother, how do, my, how do mothers make it that far in life? That's just, that's awful. Uh, do you go through that too, Mom? She just kept taking the opportunity. You don't need near-death moments. You just do it all the time. You were born for a reason. I knew that boy the moment I looked into your face. Father is speaking. You're born for a reason, and I'm telling you, don't you ever forget that reason. You may forget a lot, but don't you ever forget Jesus wanted you to be born. He has a dream for you. Wow. Desire of ages. Look at this. Desire of ages. Speaking of John the Baptist, from childhood, his mission had been kept before him, and he had accepted the holy trust. Wow. Mentoring practice number six. There are only seven of these. Here comes number six. Parents must seek the Spirit's baptism of the child. Watch this. This is beautiful. This is called like father, like son. Are you ready for this? Okay, let's do father first. Verse 67. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, you got that in uh, verse 67. Now drop down to verse 80. And the child, John, grew and became strong, the Greek can read, in the Spirit. Like father, like son. Isn't that beautiful? So, hey, mom and dad, why not pray the prayer every day? Holy Spirit, today. Look at he's only nine months old, but I'm holding him here for you. Holy Spirit, today, I want you to baptize him. I want you to baptize him with your power and your mission. Protect him. Oh, and by the way, Holy Spirit, she's, she's just 11 months old, but I wish you would baptize me too right now. Every day, ask the Holy Spirit to baptize that baby and you. Oh, my. What a difference. Yeah, but do I? Come on. This isn't John the Baptist. He, I heard Gabriel say he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit before he's born. Oh, I beg to differ with you. Watch this. Desire of Ages again on the screen. You have it in your study guide. Even the babe in its mother's arms may dwell as under the shadow of the Almighty through the faith of the praying mother. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his birth. But keep reading. If we will live, Mommy and Daddy, if we will live in communion with God, we too, Mother and Father, we may expect the divine Spirit to mold our little ones even from their earliest moment. When is the earliest moment? <gasps> ah! That's pretty much the earliest moment, isn't it? Did I get that right? From the earliest moment. Well, when he gets to be 10, when she gets to be 12... Nonsense. You start asking for the Holy Spirit to fill your child, newborn, and you never back off that prayer until you die because your children will never be out of your mind. Parents, that's why we've been given these wrinkly knees because you're a parent until you die. And that child, as long as that child is alive, is your mission field to make ready a people prepare for the Lord, to make ready a boy, to make ready a grown-up girl. doesn't matter. That's our mission. Wow. All right. There's one more. Mentoring practice number seven. Parents must control the environment of the child. 
Watch this. Read verse 80 again. We just read it. Verse 80 again. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. He lived in the wilderness. Question. Question. Can, how can parents today create a wilderness environment for their children? Answer. You control what comes into your home. Write that down. You control what comes into your home. The very word wilderness, you think about it, suggests less is better. Huh? Less of what, Dwight, are you talking about? Come on, come on. What are you talking about? Less of what? If less is better, if I'm to make a wilderness out of my home, how, what kind of less are you talking about? Well, jot down a few ideas that came to my mind. See if you can add to them. Uh, number one, less streaming. Less streaming. Listen. You've surely lived long enough to know that what gets streamed into a house these days is less and less morally fit for human consumption. I'm just saying, less streaming. In fact, there is an unseen being. Hold on, hold on to your pew now. There is an unseen being who uses Wi-Fi streaming to infiltrate the minds and lives of both children and adults in the same house. Somebody in your house Somebody has to be monitoring the content of that incoming Wi-Fi warfare into your home. And I imagine that somebody is you, young father. I imagine that somebody is you, young mother. Somebody's got to be taking control. Less. So the very word wilderness suggests less is better. What's another less, Dwight? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me give you another one. There's less streaming. You're not going to like this one. <laughs> You're not going to like this one. There's less sugar. Come on. Listen to me, please. You surely have lived long enough to know that baby food is packed full of sugar. You've lived long enough to know that kids' breakfasts, cereals, and everything else packed with sugar. You now have lived long enough to know that adult food is jam-packed with sugar because the food industry, the sugar industry, has made certain that we are all addicted to sugar. All of us. So there has to be somebody in your home that recognizes that there is an unseen being who uses appetite. I'm talking about sugar. I'm talking about alcohol. I'm talking about caffeine. Look at it. It was a big deal to Gabriel. He said, I don't want your boy, I don't want your boy drinking any of this. Now, all he could talk about back then was alcohol. There would be some others. He would say, listen, you, this child is going to be ready for Jesus to come. This child is going to be an agent for our kingdom to make ready a people prepare for the Lord. Then he, she will not drink this. And guess what, parent? You will not drink that in front of that child. You won't even drink it behind that child's back because you have the same mission your child has, which is to make ready a people prepare for the Lord. Amen. Appetite is a big deal. And there is an unseen being in your house and mine that has discovered that if he can manipulate appetite, and what's appetite? I got to have it. What's appetite? I got to have it. What's appetite mean? I got to have it, and I got to have it now. He has discovered that if he can manipulate appetite, appetite becomes the power and the passion that controls the house. There are some children who only eat one meal a day. God bless them. One meal a day. All day long. All day long. Every time that child is hungry, food goes in that mouth. Every time that child says, I want some, food goes in that mouth. Come on. If you keep cramming food by special requests from your cherub, you keep pushing food to him, you keep pushing food to her. How will she ever know that you can actually control this power inside of me that says, I have to eat right now? You don't have to eat right now. Right. And mommy and daddy, if you're pushing food to your own lips all day long, you have just negated your argument. You do. You do little snacks around the office. You do little parties at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You do. You drink that. Why can't I? 
You eat all the day. Why can't I? Come on. Somebody in your household will have to be the one to take charge so that appetite and passion are under control by all, for all occupants under your roof. Somebody in your house. I don't know who it'll be, young mother. I don't know who it'll be, young father, but it has to be somebody because there is an enemy that has said, I'll get you here. The very word wilderness suggests less is better. Let me give you just one more. You can come up with your own list beyond this. Number three, less stuff. You've surely lived long enough to know that the toy industry, the technology industry, the consumer industry live by the mantra, you got to have more, right? More toys, more gadgets, more stuff. Karen and I, if we could do it over, and she was sitting in that row this morning in first service. If we could do it over, we would never agree to the purchase of that child's first smartphone at the age in which we purchased it. I'm telling you, mom and dad, beware of the plea, but all my friends have one. Mmm. 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 -mm. No, 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 no. God bless you, young mothers. God bless you, young fathers, who have the adult courage, who have the chutzpah to say no to more stuff around your heart, more stuff around your home. No. Uh, for the John the Baptist generation of which you and I are part, just like John, control of our appetites and passions is the only way we will have the bodies and minds Christ needs for his end game movement. One last time on the screen, please, to make ready. This is our mission, folks, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's why Jesus came to endure 40 days and 40 nights of fasting so that he might conquer the appetite that has taken us all down. The whole human race has been taken down by appetite. He conquered appetite, and he says, in me you can do the same. That's why Jesus spent seven long, dark hours on Calvary to conquer sin. All, what sin? All sin, so that you and I might find that sin conquered in our lives through faith in him. Somewhere in the Bible, there is this line, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I want you to remember that line because it's not a bad one for you, young father. It's not a bad line for you, young mother, to be able to say to your children, to be able to say to your child, honey, hey, children, 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 I want you to do this. You imitate, you imitate me as I imitate Jesus. Come on, mother, that's what we're going to say to them. You imitate me. Go ahead, girl. You imitate me as I imitate Jesus. And guess what? Because if you keep your eyes on Jesus, you got that part? They'll be safe in keeping their eyes on you. And that is the truth of parenting. Amen. Think of the last time someone said, I'm praying for you. Didn't it give you a sense of peace and reassurance that somebody cares for me? I know how I feel when I get an email from one of our viewers saying, Yo, Dwight, I've been praying for you lately. There's nothing like knowing someone is praying for you. So I want to offer you an opportunity to partner. Let me, let us partner with you in prayer. If you have a special prayer request or a praise of thanksgiving you'd like to share with us, I'm inviting you to contact one of our friendly chaplains. It's simple to do. You can call our toll-free number, 877, the two words, His Will, 877, His Will. That friendly voice that answers, you tell him, you tell her what your prayer need is. We'll join with you in that petition. And may the God who answers prayer journey with you these next few days until we're right back here together again next time.